First, thank you very much for inviting me here today, and I like also to uh, congratulate you on this initiative of this this group and with your success. We recognized recently. So I think it's it's really great that you're doing this uh, uh, for a local patient and get more information out there. So uh, we had a list of questions. I'll try to get to uh, most of your uh, of your uh, question. There's already most of them have been answered uh, uh, before, and maybe we'll need to get more uh, some more precise uh, uh, answer and and details. But I'd like also to take some time to talk to you about uh, the new stuff, thing that we're doing uh, recently that may uh, you may have heard of or not. So I think that could be uh, uh, interesting. So. In terms of being able to uh, answer your, your question, there's some there's regarding you know, the immunology of transplant, where are we doing tests, where are we being sensitized, non sensitized. I think I need to review briefly a little bit what is behind the transplant, the immunology, the rejection. So, first thing, just like just basics, the immune response. Basically, we have, you, you have your lymphocyte, your T lymphocyte that really have the base of immune response. They're, they're, their uh, role is to protect you against invader, could be infection. Of course, the last in now back to 50 years, transplant is 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 new and it's a new invader to your immune system. So the central uh, cell that will uh, tell the rest of uh, your immune system that this is new, this is different, we need to get rid of it, is the T cell, and down that will you know expand and send cells and cytokine fight to destroy the new tissue. The B cell are the lymphocytes that are responsible of the antibody production. So basically, they will work together, and eventually, after a exposure, you will get antibody to help get rid of the of the uh, of the invader, and in that case, it would be the, the transplant. So the these antibody, we can now measure them. So we can know if you have antibody against antigens uh, of transplant. We're not able to measure T cells, so that's why we always, you know, look at what what is your level of antibodies. So it's a very useful tool to be able to 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 get you a, a, a compatible transplant. Second in line, blood group. Somebody asked a question about the blood group. So, in general, the basic you also add the the blood group antigens on the organ. So if you if your blood group A, you will have antibody against the blood group B. And you will go after uh, uh, your system will go after the kidney. So now I'll talk to that about a bit later. We have, you know, we have some programs to be able to overcome this. But just as a general rule, you should be the same blood group as your donor. Of course, blood group O can donate to any recipient, and blood AB can receive from any donor. Now there's. A lot of confusion, I think, you know, I'm a good match, they told me I'm a match. I think it's a bit confusing because there are basically two things here. One, we can talk about the HLA match, so how close you are in terms of your antigen to the recipient. So within a family, so if we take, you know, between brothers and sister, there'll be 25% that it will be a, be a perfect match, so it means, you know, six, or now we measure more, but let's stick, stick to the, the classic six antigen out of six, and there will be 25% that have no antigen in common, and half the brother and sister will have only three out of six. So the, be the more is the better, but actually, you know, there's not much difference between, you know, if, we, if you don't have the full set, then the rest are pretty much the same. So if you are two haplotype match, you have six out of six, that confers a great advantage. Below that, the difference, it takes thousands and thousands of patients to even show a difference. So now with the immunosuppression, we can overcome the rest, the rest, of, the, the, the rest uh, of the immunologic, um, the immunologic uh, uh, difference. Now, cross-match. So that's the real thing in terms of that, that do I match to a, to, a, to a donor. So the cross-match is a technique to be able to determine if you have already antibody, the antibody here that we talked, against the donor. So this is an example. So this is a, cro a cross match. Probably not doesn't show much the rest, but so we take your, the serum that we collected every month, we put it in contact with the cell of the donor, and then you put the, the proper ingredient. And if your antibodies are able to destroy the cells, the lymphocyte of the donor, they'll do the same with the kidney. So that's it. I mean, honestly, well, but let's say there's many red cells that would be constitute a positive cross match, and you should not get that that kidney. 
So another way to see this is that if you have a kidney that, you know, we know all, all these things, right? So this is an A2, a kidney with an antigen A2, and then if you have, if you have antibodies against A2, then what's going to happen when you get the complement? Then there'll be a, a, a rapid destruction of the kidney, the kidney will suffer. So back to, to what, so, so these are the distinction between the match. You may have a great HLA match, it could be five out of six, but you may still be incompatible because your cross match is not compatible. So the, the, if, you're, if at the end somebody, you know, transmitter says, tells you that you, you are, you have a, your cross match is negative, you are compatible, we're talking about the cross match. The PR rate, or uh, this is a, a way of measuring how much antibody you have. So some people have no antibodies, so they can basically get any next kidney that is blood group compatible. And some have antibodies, so they can only get a fraction. And we can actually precisely measure compared to the population. You know, if you're 50%, it means that you have antibody against potentially 50% of the population. So it means only one out of two donors will match with you. If you're 100%, it's going to be very difficult to get a transplant. So how do you get these antibodies? So you need your system has to have seen these HLA molecules somewhere. So it could be through pregnancy, transfusion, previous transplant. We sometimes see patients who have none of these and they still have antibodies. So we think now there's also some previous infection that could be quite similar to the, the HLA antibody and may give you these, these, these antibodies. So now, uh, this is going to be maybe a bit, uh, uh, a bit of repetition, but just to review. When, when you have this match and you're called, how that did work. So Unio's rule for attribution that's been reviewed is, and maybe in a bit in detail, so you're getting one point or per year of waiting. But also the rest of the, you know, most other centers, with the exception of this R center, there's also a factor of matching that is thrown in. So you would get one point per, per match with the DR locus, which the patient, the donor can have too. So to, to decide who has the most point, who's getting the kidney. So this is outside of our region. So you can understand that if you're in a region like here, where anyway, you would have eight years of waiting time. So it's eight plus or minus two, it's still gonna be the driving factor, will still be the, the wait time. But if you're in a region where the waiting time is very short, one year, you can see that the, the list is very unpredictable. It can be anybody tomorrow because you can, you can get two points here and one point there, you have three points compared to somebody who has waited already two years. So, but in this, in this region, for the time being, you know, they're changing in the horizon, but for the time being, it's only the waiting time. So basically, if somebody has been listed in your blood group, before you, you would normally have offers uh, uh, bef before you. So that's why the waiting time is, is very important and uh, that allows us to be a bit, a bit more predictable in terms of telling who is at the top of the list. There's an exception, any time you can get, a, we call it a zero mismatch. It's in a way it's kind of a perfect match from the deceased list. And if it matches you, even if you have been listed three months, you can still have this, and this is within the region. To receive a zero mismatch from outside the region, you need to be at least a little bit sensitized. If you need to be 20%. If you're not sensitized, you will not have these offers anymore. So that's why the monthly testing is to be able to have a sample in our lab when you have an offer that we can run the cross match. And also we can regularly determine sensitization to see if anything happened to you. We don't want to have a surprise at the last minute where you have been sensitized to A2 and we don't know that and you get a transplant and you get an early rejection. So going back to their question that you had in terms of what does happen and I think I covered that uh, greatly. So uh, the question were, you know, uh, Brain death is the first thing to offer. The patient needs to be the care of brain death before you get you, you go further. The next step is the constant for the nation. And yes, there's there's medical evaluation of donor, uh, including by the donor, doctors on site, past medical history, physical exam, and there's labs that are run. There's some set of labs that are 
done on all the donors. For example, you know, you see the creatinine for the kidney function, the enzyme of the liver, and some cases even the cardiologist may want to have an angiogram of the heart to see if they want to use this heart or not, some specific tests for the, the lungs, and so forth. There's also tests that are done also for the purpose to make sure that uh, there is no active infection that can be transmitted, particularly we're looking at hepatitis C, HIV, and uh, you know you do as much as you can, and you understand that there. That's why we always, in your consent for transplant, there's always I think there's something there that says there's a possible of disease transmission from the donor because even if you do a very good exam and good labs. There's always things that are microscopic, not seen, that could be a risk for the recipient that we cannot otherwise uh, see at that time point. But this being said, even even if you if, you, if when it happens, it's 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 a it's really a, a, a disaster. But it's really rare. We rarely uh, see that see that. So the attribution of the organ, so that, as Kathy said, when you, you you start counting centers, and that's why there's variability in time. The first one is. If the donor is stable or not. So if the donor is, is, is brain dead, but we know that it's very unstable, and you may not have much time, so you may have to set up an OR time rapidly, even if you don't know the name of all the recipients at that point. If you're fortunate to have the donor that is quite stable, you can do a lot. So that's why some case, sometimes, you know, you, you may even have the cross match for the kidney. For the kidney transplant, we need the cross match. It would take six to eight hours to do once the specimen in your, is in your lab. So it still needs to be transported, get to the lab. So that's why there's, there's some time. But if you do have the result, it's quite possible that then CTDM will say, well, we have an offer for Joe Green. Uh, and then we ask uh, Mr. Green to come in the hospital, maybe even before the donor surgery has happened. And then they could be, they could, they can have some delays. The OR there is delayed because there's trauma, uh, things like that. So it's possible, as mentioned by some of you in this, in this, in this question, that you end up being in, in the at Stanford or any other hospital uh, for hours before you get the transplant. In our perspective, this is a good thing. It's better for you to wait for the organ than the organ waiting for you, because we want to minimize the time in between the uh, the, the 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 organ uh, have been taken out of the body and reperfused in your body. So I hope this helps a little bit to understand understand the process and answer specifically your question. And now I'd like to. Uh, talk to you about uh, 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 a recent uh, uh, study that we have published. It's been like 40 years of research to get to that point and 10 years of clinical uh, clinical experimentation. And this is our project of tolerance. Tolerance means trying to get the patient off drugs after transplant, hopefully for as long as, as, as possible to avoid uh, the, the, the side effects of this medication. So there was a little clip on TV uh, regarding this, and I think the presentation is very well, and we'll see if we can present this. And you'll let me know if, it, if we can uh, if it present well. An evolutionary approach to organ transplants developed right here in the Bay Area. It's had some amazing results. Dr. Kim joining us with details of those results, Kim. Well, Alan, to prevent rejection and organ damage, patients need to take powerful and expensive drugs for the rest of their lives. Now, Stanford doctors have come up with a way around that. About two years ago, 38-year-old Meg Alguino of San Jose needed a kidney transplant. The donor, her sister Elizabeth. Stanford doctors told the New Yorker she was a perfect match. And she called me all excited and said, look, they have this amazing protocol going on. I mean, I think we should do this. Meg and Elizabeth did. They joined a small clinical trial at Stanford. The goal, to train Meg's body to accept her sister's donated kidney as if it were her own, without the lifelong need for powerful anti-rejection drugs. And this has been the, uh, uh, so to speak, the holy grail of uh, organ transplantation over many years to do the organ transplantation without drugs. Dr. Samuel Strober headed up the team. He says while the use of anti-rejection medication is critical, the drugs come at a cost. The main side effects are infection, uh, high blood pressure, uh, increased risk of cancer, increased risk of diabetes, and increased risk of heart disease. And they even can damage the kidney. 
A month before the transplant, Stanford scientists harvested an abundance of blood stem cells from Elizabeth. After the transplant, Meg was started on anti-rejection drugs. Over a two-week period, she had radiation that targeted and suppressed her immune system. It was a, a small price to pay. Then, through an IV, her sister's stem cells were introduced into Meg's body to mix and become part of Meg's immune system. We inject the donor blood stem cells, and then they began to grow in the bone marrow and immune tissues of the recipient. Six months later, Meg was weaned off all anti-rejection drugs. That was 18 months ago. She's back to living an active life with her husband and two kids. Thanks to her sister and... I would just give a shout out to the team standard because they're amazing. Dr. Strober says the challenge right now is to go from these perfectly matched patients who are tissue matched with their donors to patients who are less well matched, sort of half matched, so that almost any sibling or parent or child could be a donor. That would greatly increase the number of potential donors and greatly improve the lives of thousands and thousands of patients. Absolutely. Really exciting. Thanks. So, uh, just going back a little bit on what we're doing to to, to achieve this, so again, this was, if we go back to the first couple of slides, this was between brothers and sisters that are perfectly matched, so they are HLA identical, and of course they were cross-match negative. Uh, so the difference in terms of the treatment compared to a standard transplant, so there's a low dose radiation that is given to, given to the lymph node around the neck and the, uh, the spleen and the abdominal lymph nodes to create room for later the engraftment of the stem cell and medication that we give currently for many other patients for after transplant, which is thymoglobulin. So when, at, when after the transplant, this is when this is completed within the first uh, two weeks, so basically the patient is, is discharged at the end of the week and complete the, complete the treatment at the, in, as an outpatient the, the second week. And then on Friday afternoon, they receive the this, this stem cell, and then we look in the blood to see if they're going to grow, and we want their presence for at least six months. And if that's the case, and there's no rejection, the biopsy is clean, then they're weaned off gradually of the uh, immunosuppressive drugs. So, so far where we are, so we, we actually now have uh, 17 uh, uh, patients enrolled and actually next Monday, number 18 will be, will be uh, at surgery. So 11 of them have been taken off immunosuppression. So for some uh, in the, in, during the last year, so from five months, and some have been out there without any immunosuppression for more than three years, four years for the, uh, the, the longest and two are being uh, weaned, uh, weaned in the period of uh, weaning off to smaller dose as we speak. So four patients were uh, not able to be taken off the medication, and however, they have excellent graft function on minimal immunosuppression. So now that we have completed this phase of the study with basically the patients that are the easiest to probably try to achieve this type of, of, of tolerance protocol, now we're moving up trying to extend this to all living uh, donor, even if they are not as well uh, as well matched. So, next, shifting gears a little bit in terms of you know, as we mentioned here, barriers to uh, uh, to transplant. You have a donor, but the cross match is positive. You have the donor, but the blood group is not the wrong is 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 not yours. So, how can we overcome this? So, basically, two main strategies: desensitization. To make you make you uh, 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 compatible now uh, uh, with this donor, or proceed with exchange that would that would uh, obviate this problem. So we have a uh, program of desensitization that's now more going on for more than three years. The um, uh, the one of the specialists, world specialists, Dolly Tayan, who developed this protocol more than ten years in Cedar Sinai have moved to our uh, center five years ago, so we benefit from all their experience, and, and we probably have one of the best histo compatibility lab in the country, in even putting to market new tests that helps doing this. So basically, it's a long process. You need to give, uh, but the key ingredient is the immunoglobulin, so IPIG, so this is a large load of antibodies that you give uh, 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 on a monthly basis, we can add also some other medication to help uh, the process. We're actually, this is going to be you know, always a flavor of Stanford, so it's 
it's excellence and care, but also we are doing research and we are doing trying to, uh, you know, advance the field in this area. We would some centers are doing this up front, and we 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 believe that uh, it's it's uh, this may be uh, probably more successful, and we keep these uh, uh, therapy if the first line does not work out. So again, try to look back at this uh, poor kidney A2. So you add the, the antibody in circulation that are uh, anti the anti A2. So now we have these these immunoglobulin, this plasma antibody that that hopefully will protect the kidney from these antibody at acting as as uh, 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 blocking antibodies. So the kidney will remain smiling. <laughs> So this is an example of what happened. So this is an old study, but it's the same principle. So you have people that were at 100% sensitized and they received this treatment. So all the response are different. So there's one patient who did not respond at all, and some respond dramatically, and some are in between. But the fact that you go down may be enough to open the door to transplant. You just need one compatible donor. So this is, well, it's a, this is a bit old. And Last, from last year, there's probably six or seven more patients, but this is what our initial uh, uh, initial uh, experience uh, with uh, 12 patients. So six had the previous transplant, and usually they're the, more, the most difficult to turn around. And they were sensitized 65 to 100 percent, and uh, they had waited uh, a long time. So eight had a previous donor that were able to desensitize to them, uh, you know, a living donor. And we did, which is a bit more difficult, able to desensitize four to the transplant list. So we, you do this on people that are, you know, at, are the top of the list. So if you were able to remove the antibody that, antibody that prevent them from being transplanted, then they will have an offer that will, that will get through. So the follow-up, which is longer, uh, so far I can tell you that it worked in all, all these patients after the transplant. None lost their, their transplant, they're all alive. And most, most remarkable, we didn't even have one episode of this antibody-mediated rejection. We had one regular rejection which was treated, and basically they're, they're all doing pretty well. So now, ABO incompatible. If you have your blood group, your blood group A and the donor's blood group B, well then you can use kind of variation of the same team. Then you would the plasma pharesis to get this antibody out and use these these medication. And when you get your titer, because this is going to be measured titers low, then you come you can proceed with transplant. So we have we have done seven pairs so far, and uh, they have all worked out perfectly so at this point. So now donor exchange is an alternative to this. So same principle. You are you are uh, 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 incompatible because of blood group to your, your uh, recipient and you have the reverse situation somewhere else, well then if you, if you go this, this route and everybody gets a transplant, that is compati compatible. So the same principle applies if you were blood group compatible but your cross match was positive, maybe you can find somebody else that the antigen is, is you don't have anybody against their antigen and then you can make this work. So the pair exchange model, basically, you need you have your donor recipient, and you need to, to find it hopefully in a larger pool uh, somebody that is in the reverse situation than you are, and then you can start making these exchange. The chain is a bit different because it starts with a uh, al all donors are altruistic. So altruistic, non-directed donor, somebody that wants to donate a kidney but does not need to have a, a kidney back in exchange for their recipient. So it does. You know, it does help because now you can release other pe other people in the in these these uh, chain by providing an additional kidney without necessarily having uh, uh, one waiting in the back. So this can start a chain that that then things can start to happen and may uh, 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 allow transplant that were not possible in the previous uh, previous system. So same thing. You start with. It, it, Start with the donor, and then goes to this one, and this one, and then be done to the, give it, give to the next one. Of course, the logistics is a bit complex because it may involve many centers across the country, and you're probably seeing this also over the news. There, there's some uh, there are kidney flying over the United States for a couple of days. So this is one chain last year that we were involved. So it was a chain length of uh, you know eight transplant, but there have been longer chain now, like 30 transplant, and this is our 
pair, so she she donated to some somebody else in uh, in LA, and he received a kidney from uh, uh, the uh, the East Coast. That's post something number one. She was able to visit with him, and that was the follow up one year later. And uh, unfortunately, I cannot get rid of this Photoshop. <laughs> So, in conclusion, uh, these are you know new things that are available to help recipients get trans uh, get uh, uh, transplant. Hopefully, can help a few more uh, transplant. One probably one thing that is a bit uh, 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 particular to us, we do see those two uh, uh, option not as you know comp competitive but as complementary so some center do only desensitization or some center do only exchange so we do both and we do actually look at the case and see what would be the, the best in terms of, of uh, getting a, uh, a chance of a transplant and sometimes in some cases we have used both so desensitized but they were not able to be desensitized to their already intended donor but putting them in the chain in addition then we were able to 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 bring it to a point that they were able to get a transplant from the chain so combining the, the desensitization and the um, the uh, 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 fair exchange to to maximize the chance of transplant so this is our group and uh, uh, then thank you very much for your time your attention and that will be happy to uh, to uh, take some uh, questions so I think so I really probably have answered your question about the incompatible donor and then the question regarding why should you be at Stanford when you can get the transplant somewhere else faster so you just have to understand that somewhere else may be farther uh, away from home that's why we you, we, we talked to you about multiple listening so in CTBN, so in terms of region in the country that has the longest waiting time, it's going to be probably ours the longest, New York second, LA maybe third, and there are some places in the Midwest that uh, the transplant waiting time is very short. Kansas City can transplant probably all their, their blood group A in one year. Gainesville, Florida is also very short. So if you do have the ability to, to, to go there and be available to them, that involves, so it, the downside is involved uh, additional resource, time, and also you need probably to relocate for a couple months there after your transplant, and maybe even one before to be there available at the time of transplant. So it's not it's not something that is available to all. I would I would hope that eventually you know the attribution of of, uh, of kidney to the country will minimize this geographical discrepancy because there's no reason in my mind that why people here should wait longer uh, than other places. So organs should try should move around a, a little bit more. I think that may take some time. I think maybe uh, uh, we'll see a, a small incremental uh, 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 improvement in that uh, in, in that area. However, you need to look at those centers and see what type of, of uh, uh, result they have, also, they have also. Be careful, you know, so you probably, in this region, you are very well served. If you would rank the three transplant centers, CPMC, uh, UCSF, and Stanford in the country, probably still be in the 10 best one. So you have to look what you're trading for, too. Okay. And he's a new Thank you very much, Dr. Boost. Question for Dr. Moose. Uh, gentleman in the white, yes. Uh, that video you showed about that woman who, um, the CBS Channel 5 video, mm -hmm. how do you get involved in that program? What's that? How do you get involved in the program? Okay, so to be involved, you need, you need, okay, to uh, be, uh, uh, have the inclusion criteria of the study, which means first, you need a living donor. We're not doing this yet with deceased donors. But this being said, we have devised the protocol to be only after transplant, thinking for the future. Because some other, there's two, only two other places in the country that are doing this type of stuff. But they're doing, they're starting before the transplant. So they will always be limited with living donors. So eventually we hope that we can move that way. But at this point, you need a living donor. You need to be in our mind, uh, low risk for rejection. So if you are sensitized, this isn't, we're not there yet. Uh, you need otherwise to be a good candidate, low risk for transplant. So if you have cardiac disease and it, this, we, 
this is, this is the difference between what we can offer for river transplant and what's part of the research. Then you need your donor to be uh, to be willing to do the process, which is you know it's it, 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 it's it's not a huge deal, but it's more than just giving the kidney. It means that six weeks before the transplant, they have to receive injection underneath the skin to boost their stem cell from the bone marrow, and then they need to be collected for three or four days. So it looks like a, a you know plasmapheresis machine looks like a dialysis machine, and then we collect the cells, but. Beside that additional week, their, their involvement is pretty similar to a uh, re uh, regular dona uh, donation. So basically, this is the basics. So this is a first kidney transplant with your living donor. So we are not able at this point to say, well, people who already have a transplant, I want to come off my medication, I need to be recycled. We, we cannot do that at this point, maybe in the future. Other questions? I uh, guess. How long has Stanford been doing this? You said how long has Stanford been doing the decent Oh, uh, it's is it uh, it's three years or four? It's going to be four years in the um, in, in in the spring, I think. Yeah, we started and we started slow, put the thing in place because you know you might know uh, understand by the complexity that it's not only medically complex, it's financially complex. So we needed the hospital to be in line with us. There's some centers that don't want to go there at all. Yes, gentlemen in the black. Uh, once some tissue uh, uh, is available, I suppose the whole organs uh, in your center, and you're trying to cross match, does that mean when that fails, uh, the time expires and that organ becomes no longer viable, or so, do you have an aggressive program to get that tissue match performed while, if it doesn't work, there's time to do it one more time? Yes. So we try. That's why you know, uh, as Kathy mentioned, there we're. we're we're they're calling for more than one patient. Sometimes we receive a call, are you interested to do the cross match? It's your fifth backup, your fifth down the list, okay? You still want to do it. And then I have to make a decision because then we're gonna send a lot of people to, to the lab, try to do something for a kidney transplant that is unlikely to happen. But we need we need this buffer of one, two, or three. And sometimes we use our judgment. If the first one is sensitized, but it's only 25%, so you know, like I get a transplant. If you have two that are one percent, maybe you now we need to go you know, do five down the down the list. But let's say, for example, the worst case scenario, even if you do five or six, and then you do not, uh, they all uh, they all uh, cross match uh, positive, and you cannot allow them. Then the chemo will go down to the unsensitized, the next unsensitized patient who can get it right away without any further cross match. So these, these, the kidneys, the kidneys, the kidney will not be lost because of the, of the cross matching uh, requirements. Most of the time these days, and this is something that has been developed in the Bay Area, uh, actually with one of the the, the previous tissue typer at Stanford, to try to obtain the blood from the donor, ship to the the the, the, the histo lab, so we can start this cross match way way before even the donor surgery has, has been done. So we do have a lot of time. Still at many, some, many places in the country and in the past, people wait for the kidney to come with the tubes and the lymph node to start a cross match. So then the clock is already ticking on the kidney. So fortunately, we're, we're most of the time not in that situation. Very good. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I have a couple of questions regarding tolerance induction. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing you said that uh, the donor has to be ready to take some injections. Mm -hmm. How many injections that he has to take and what are the long-term side effects of those injections to the donor? And the second thing is, does this program, you said that we currently adopted only for a 100% HLA match. If someone has a 50% HLA match, can he also go for that? Okay. So these injections are GCSF, so colony stimuli factor, which have been used in thousands and thousands of patients. The side effects are usually short term, and they're not seen in a patient, and they're related to what's happening. It, this hormone tells your bone marrow to produce. Some patients have bone pain because they feel the bone marrow filling up, and maybe a bit of malaise, but usually it's pretty mild. From the thousands of patients uh, 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 treated with this, it doesn't appear that there is uh, long-term side effects to be expected from this. Number two, we have completed with the 100% match, or the, the two-apotype match, and we're still offering this. 
But now we open to start patients with less well match. So it could be half match, and now we're even considering to take people that uh, have even less than three out of six. So basically, we're opening the door to any living donor combination pair that would meet the other inclusion criteria. Okay, I have a couple of more questions on the same concept, same idea. So maybe you know we'll let other people question and then we can talk. There will be a social hour out there where you can ask the presenters additional questions. So any other questions from our audience? Uh, yes, sir. I'm new at this, so I don't know if this is an appropriate question or not. What percentage of the patients uh, don't survive this kidney operation? Okay, so the mortality from a kidney transplant, we try to minimize this. That's why we do these 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 these, these screenings. So, it, it, the way to see this is that despite all the best screening we can do, the best clinical assessment, are there still people dying from transplant? The answer is yes. If you look at the statistic in kidney transplant, it's around two percent at one year, and of course it it does increase with time because there's some of these. If these patients have coronary disease and they have a heart attack three years, four years, and then it's not it's it's not related to the operation. But what we would would try to to avoid is at you know at least uh, 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 minimize the risk of dying from the operation because then of course you don't have any benefit from the, from from the transplant, and uh, so the the average is around two percent in the first year. We have time for another question. Uh, yes, ma'am? Um, about a year ago, um, we went to Stanford and went through the orientation. And uh, I think it was on the second day that uh, we told uh, the coordinator that our, our donor was an unrelated young man, you know, who, out of the kindness of his heart, wanted to see my daughter. And then we were told that uh, you know he could not help us because you had uh, some kind of policy about not allowing unrelated, unaffiliated uh, living donors you know, to help. And I'm just wondering, do you still have that uh, 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 policy? You know, because uh, the person you know who eventually saved my daughter's life because she was really very ill with complications as you know, in a few minutes. This person is not related to us whatsoever. You know, she just she found us, you know, and they, and she came and, and helped us. Of course, we had to go to a, a different hospital. Yeah, this is a. a um, uh, you know, a very controversial subject. Who can be a donor? And the and you know, there's many opinion in in the field from very you know extreme liberal. There's people who promoted that donors could be paid to donate, and at the extreme that you should be only even a family member to to donate. At Stanford, we have the uh, policy that the donor needs to have a, uh, a relationship with uh, with uh, the with uh, the donors. It can be friends, it can, can be family member, but we do not take donors uh, that are not, uh, have no relationship with the family. We're not the only one in, in that area, but that's why it's good to, that there's more than one transplant center, so if other centers feel differently, want to do uh, differently, well then you're, you have the opportunity to be able to, uh, to have your care at that center. On that note, I want to thank you for your questions, and we're going to move on to our next speaker.